Wow. All right, everybody. Well, we're right at 945. So I, I want to definitely give the opportunity to um, professors Rob Baker and Ed Hasecki, who we get the great pleasure of hearing from about dem democracy and elections in a polarized America. And my, oh my, we've got a lot going on, don't we? So I, want, I don't want to take any more of their time. Um, please do add questions to the chat and we will get to those uh, after the conversation. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Ed and to Rob. Well, hi everyone. So it's great to see you all. So um, I don't know how familiar you all are comfortable are with sort of Zoom world. And so we've gotten really good at doing this in the sense of uh, there's some basic rules that I just kind of want to um, lay down. So with this many people, um, it would be best to mute yourself um, if you're not talking. And so you can do that on the bottom left corner of your screen. Okay. Um, there's just can be a lot of cross noise that happens um, and, and, and what have you. Um, so muting would be great, and then um, putting things in the chat, questions in the chat as we go would be would be helpful. And um, Rob and I will pause at various points, and we can answer some of those questions. It's fu it's fun to be here. So as you can probably tell from my um, name, I'm an alum also. So I graduated in in '97, and uh, maybe like some of you, um, you know, my wife's a Wittenberg alum. We met in the Wittenberg choir. I was saying in the choir with uh, um, Alan and Pam's uh, eldest daughter, um, Elizabeth, and, and uh, I don't know why she didn't get up this early, um, so I'm kind of disappointed she's not here. Um, but it's kind of fun to be in this situation because I not only see sort of that connection of, of parents of, of my classmates, but there were my classmates there, uh, uh, at least a couple I think were planning to be here. Um, as well as now a lot of uh, current and former students. And so Taylor, I like the beard. That looks pretty good. Um, it's been a long time. It took me a minute to recognize you. So that was kind of fun to see. And it's, it's great to see so many. How do you turn the camera on? Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna talk today about, um, we're gonna focus more on the electoral college um, because I think that institution has the potential to have a pretty big impact um, on the election this year. And so there's been a lot of talk about that. And so we're going to go through some of the um, history of where that came from, uh, make some comments about that, um, talk a little bit about some reforms that have been proposed, um, and then open it up to general conversation that can kind of go wherever you'd like it to go. Um, so when we start talking about kind of this, this strange system of how we elect our president, I want to make a little bit of, or create a little context first. And so you may, you may recall that the Constitution was created um, uh, as our second form of government. We had the Articles of Confederation prior to that. Um, and so a lot of what was happening at the time um, as the framers got together to write this new Constitution so they had a number of things on their mind um, that they wanted to keep or that they were sort of wrestling with. Um, one of these attitudes that they brought into the convention was a lot of them had a pretty healthy distrust of democracy, right? They had started to see this happening and actually were a little nervous about what could happen as the passions of the people were unleashed. And so one of the things we have to keep in mind is that they, they weren't... Um, they weren't in favor of complete and total democracy at that moment. They wanted some sort of mechanism that could intervene. Um, that uh, one of the big shifts um, was that they were now gonna be creating an executive power. And so one of the things that factors into this is that they were worried about some abuse um, and what that was going to be. They had just fought a revolution trying to get rid of a, a remote um, executive. And so that abuse was something they were thinking about. And another thing that was really dominant during the convention was this divide between big and small states and really a question of power, which states were going to have more influence over others. And, and that also mapped on to kind of industrial versus agricultural economies. Um, uh, and the agricultural economies, of course, that exhibited itself primarily in terms of slavery. So now they uh, had decided at some point along the way um, at uh, that they were going to settle on having a single president, and that was actually up for debate. But um, once they figured that out, they, they knew that there were two main ways they could go about doing this. Um, they could have Congress elect the president, 
Um, so that was a serious consideration and actually part of the original plan that was brought by Madison. Um, or they could have the president elected by the people. However, neither of these plans were very attractive. Um, so one group basically said, no, we can't elect the president from Congress. Um, that one of the key ways that we're gonna control this new government is to have separation of powers. And so if the president was elected by Congress, well, that's gonna mingle those powers a little bit too much and create a lot of opportunity for corruption. And the other group was saying, well, we can't have this elected by the people um, because those passions of the people could take over and we'd have this populist president who would then potentially wield too much power. There could be a demagogue sort of created. And um, in addition, uh, in that sort of power between big states and small states, direct election would have meant that the big states would have a bigger say over who was elected than the smaller states. So this was pretty much a stalemate throughout the whole thing. They had set up the entire, um, uh, or most of the documents. At the end of the convention, they created a committee called the Committee on Details, and they were gonna send this information off to this committee to say, you gotta go now work out some of these things that we haven't been able to figure out. And one of those was, um, how are we gonna elect the president? Um, now, during the creation of the Constitution, two big compromises happened that we're going to factor in here. So the first was a big compromise about Congress, and we call that the Great Compromise. Um, and this was uh, this idea that the House of Representatives would be elected based, or representation would be based on population, and in the Senate it would be equal representation. And that Great Compromise allowed both the big states and the small states to get their kind of way in terms of what that representation would be. And when it comes to the House of Representatives, you know, the question was, well, how much, if it's based on population, how much representation do I get? And the issue at stake there was that the Southern states said, we wanna count our slaves in terms of population uh, for um, representation. We're not gonna let them vote, but we do want them to uh, count for our representation. So the big compromise there was the three-fifths compromise where uh, slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person in terms of population. And the reason I bring that up is because as this committee goes to the Committee on Details, essentially Madison shows up and says, oh wait, I have a brilliant idea. Why don't we just use that idea of embodied in the Great Compromise and how we've set up Congress to elect the president? We'll solve this issue of it can't be elected by Congress by creating these electors, this other group that is independent of Congress and use them as the people who will uh, elect the president. Um, and uh, we're gonna deal with all of these representational challenges because the number of electors that each state gets is going to be equal to the number of representatives they have in Congress, both the House and the Senate. So that is basically where the Electoral College came from. Now, I think over time, we've developed a kind of mythology around the Electoral College that this was somehow some great, you know, ingenious scheme that the, the founders put together with some great thought. And some of that comes from the fact that in the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton, um, and there's not a song about this, unfortunately, or I'd give that a go, but Alexander Hamilton um, in Federalist 68, uh, uh, gave a really great sort of defense of why this electoral college would be a wonderful thing. And in, in part, you know, what he said was, you know, we're gonna have a bunch of independent statesmen and that this electoral college is a way for um, statesmen like people who would be appointed by the states to exercise an independent judgment and to really look at sort of the, uh, the character of the, the candidates for president and only put forward or elect those presidents that would be of the utmost character and worthy of this particular position. And that's what Hamilton argued. Right? Now that's largely a, a rationalization after the fact, um, but uh, that's kind of come to be sort of why people sometimes think the Electoral College was created. So I wanna pause for just a minute and insert a note about something um, that's, that's important and will be important going forward. And this is this idea of what does it mean for a political system to have legitimacy? Okay. And so the debate over how to elect a president or really the whole debate over the constitution itself is a debate over what rules are going to create a system 
that the people will accept as a producing outcomes that they that they're okay with. And so think about this as like if you're playing a board game, right, the rules are spelled out and those rules are going to produce winners and losers. And the key question in any game is whether or not the loser feels like the game was fair. That is, would those losers be willing to play the game again? Or do they feel like the game was somehow biased in a way that advantages the winner unfairly? And so if the win losers are going to be willing to accept the outcome and play that game again, um, they need to believe that they could win next time. And if that's the case, then those rules, that process confer a certain legitimacy on, on that process and on the outcome. And a political system is stable because people see that the rules of the game are fair and that they're willing to accept the outcome if they lose. In other words, they're willing to just, just sort of keep going. The creation of the Electoral College was a compromise where delegates felt their vote in the process was weighted enough Right, that they felt they were going to have enough say in who the president was going to be so that they would be willing to accept that outcome. It's a system that they thought would be able to confer legitimacy on the election of a president. Now, part of this idea of legitimacy we want to keep in mind is that just because you create the rules you think will be fair doesn't mean that it's actually going to turn out that way. Right? And so this was a big theory. This was a big guess. You know, we, we've come up with this compromise. We're willing to go along with this plan, but we actually have to sort of play the game and see how it works out. Um, you know, I, I have kids uh, and I, we, during quarantine, we played a lot of Foursquare and it reminded me how much when you play Foursquare or other kinds of playground games, how much um, as the game is played, you renegotiate the rules right? It's like, wait a minute, that wasn't exactly fair. Or this person had an advantage that I wasn't um, uh, thinking about. And so you start renegotiating some of these things. Um, in all of those sort of playground games and in politics as a whole, you know, the losers of the game, if they don't feel like the outcomes are legitimate or that something is stacked against them or that someone has an unfair ad advantage, then they're either going to pack up their things and go home or we need to revise the rules. And political institutions are no different than that. The framers created a set of rules. They set up this, this electoral college, but the rules don't work out as expected. They're going to need to change some of that in order to maintain legitimacy. And actually, that happened pretty quickly. So the early experience of the electoral college um, uh, right after, uh, so George Washington was not controversial. He, he won a unanimous vote both times, um, not really any surprise there. Everyone was okay with that. But when Washington stepped down and, and Adams ran, um, uh, it was Adams versus Jefferson largely in that uh, 1796 election. And in that election, um, Adams won the, the most votes in the Electoral College, and Jefferson was the runner-up. And now we are used to sort of thinking about that. Well, Adams would have been then elected president, and Jefferson would have lost, right? But under the original rules, it was actually that the person who came in first was going to be president, and the person who came in second would be vice president. And this was the idea that the framers really thought that what was going to happen is all of these electors were going to get together. They were going to think about who was the best person for the job. And the second, the person who got the second most votes should be really the second best person for the job. And so if something were to happen to the president, we'd want the second best person. And that would make some sense. What they didn't anticipate, though, was political parties. And so these political parties created this situation where Adams, a Federalist, had as his vice president, Jefferson, a Democratic Republican, someone of the other party. And then in 1800, this sort of reared itself again. The parties started to say, well, okay, now we have to act strategically. We've got to figure out how we strategically work this. And so Jefferson gets the, gets, um, is, or the next time around, Jefferson is getting the greatest number of votes. And within the Democratic Republicans, they said, well, we need to be strategic. One of our electors needs to not vote for Burr, the, uh, Jefferson's vice presidential candidate, so that Jefferson gets the most votes and Burr gets the second most votes. But some sort of broke, there was a breakdown in communication and it turned out that Jefferson and Burr tied. 
And if there is a tie in the Electoral College, that means the House of Representatives gets to decide. And so we had in 1800 a bit of a constitutional crisis. This is a big, this is the first big change in what we'd think of as party control. And Burr both saw an opportunity where he was going to be vice president, but now he thought, oh, maybe I could actually be president. So I'm not going to concede um, or at least signal that that would be okay. And the Federalists saw an opportunity to create some trouble. They really didn't want Jefferson. And so the Federalists sort of laid this or kept this going. And so this stalled out. They went for about five days. They took several, 34 votes. Nothing happened. Nothing changed. And it was getting to the point that people were nervous. At the time, March 4th was Inauguration Day. And they thought to themselves, what would happen if we haven't figured out who the president's going to be and Inauguration Day happens, right? And we don't have a president to inaugurate. What's going to happen? Well, some wheeling and dealing, Alexander Hamilton, you know, gets involved and starts arguing for um, that really for the sake of the union, they need to um, elect Jefferson president. Um, that's sort of famously encapsulated in the, in the musical, if you want. And, um, and uh, it took some Federalists uh, within the House to kind of flip some state delegations and it, and it was settled. But this led to the 12th Amendment and the 12th Amendment um, separated the vote for president and vice president. In other words, it adjusted the rules to the game because um, at that point, politics had changed. And politics had changed in a way that suddenly made the outcome of the Electoral College not necessarily live up to what they were expecting. And it created a kind of legitimacy crisis. So what is, how does the Electoral College work right now? Let me do a quick overview there. So right now, every um, state has electors that are equal to their representation in Congress. And so that's the number of their House members plus two senators. So every state has at least three electors. And uh, Washington, D.C. also gets three electors, even though it doesn't actually have representation or voting representation in Congress. And so that's a total of 538 electors. And in order to win, you have to get a majority. And so that's 270 electoral college votes. If there's no majority, if no candidate gets a majority, the House elects the president and the Senate elects the vice president. Now, how are electors appointed? And this is where our election comes in, the thing that we think about. So on November 3rd this year, we will go to the polls and we'll vote or right now you might start voting, uh, casting in your, or turning in your um, uh, early votes, uh, what have you. There's, there's a lot of early voting that can occur. But essentially there's an electoral process that happens. The people vote and those votes are counted. And once all those votes are counted, it's the obligation of the Secretary of State in, that, in a state to certify that election result, to give the official count. And once that election is certified, then that declares which electors will be appointed. And all states except two um, do a winner take all system, which means that whoever wins the popular vote in that state, the slate of electors that were put together for that party are appointed to the electoral college based on that outcome. It's not then until um, the middle of December. So it's the uh, Monday after the second Wednesday in December. So this year, that's December 14th. The Electoral College will actually, uh, or the electors will meet in their state capitals and cast their votes. Actually this year, I don't know, maybe that'll be virtual. I don't know how they're gonna do that. Um, but they have to cast their official votes. And then those votes are put together um, and sent to Congress. And on January 6th, Congress uh, opens the votes and counts all of them. Now, one of the big things to keep in mind is, you know, so we have an election and we have um, uh, votes cast. And so what's going to happen if a vote is close? That is, how much time is there to actually settle the election, to appoint these electors? Voting, um, counting votes can take time. And even in a regular year, you're, we're used to seeing, oh, well, the election is declared on election night because people are projecting who the winner is going to be. But the official vote count doesn't, isn't settled for often weeks later. 
And that's because there are mail-in ballots that are still coming in. There's military ballots from overseas. They have to process provisional ballots that have been cast on election day in order to get the accurate count. And so there's a, a delay in when the actual certification of that occurs. We just assume it's all figured out because um, we're able to kind of project uh, what will happen. But we, we never really know the actual uh, official result on election night. And as those official results come in, right, those official results can trigger recounts in some cases. There are close elections. And so uh, states sometimes have automatic recount provisions, um, or there can be errors or, or, or things come about the candidates themselves or the campaigns could contest the results of saying that there was some uh, errors going on. And so all of that can take some time. That can create some confusion. Um, and so there is a, there's a, a law that says that um, in order for the Congress to accept the electors that were appointed by a state, those states have to officially appoint those electors six days before the Electoral College. And that's called the safe harbor deadline. And that creates a, a time pressure. And that most recently was a big deal in the 2000 election. So you may remember, a lot of you may recall that in 2000, we had a bit of a challenge in Florida. Uh, so all of you from Florida, right? You've got your voting. And, and um, the, the issue was uh, the way that ballots were set up created some confusion. The election was incredibly close. And so there was some uh, desire to have some recounts. And so there were, were court challenges that, that were requiring a recount. The Florida Supreme Court didn't rule on whether a recount could happen until four days before the safe harbor deadline. And so that meant that if that decision stood, they would have four days to recount all the votes and figure out what was happening. And um, this was then appealed up to the Supreme Court and Bush v. Gore was the big decision where essentially they said that the recount couldn't continue because you can't selectively recount, it violates equal protection was the argument. But Bush v. Gore was decided on the day of the safe harbor deadline, which meant that even if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way, Florida was going to have to secure or, or uh, certify a certain its electors. Um, and at that time they had certified the Republican electors um, they were going to need to do that in order to meet the safe harbor deadline and, and make sure that their, their electors were appointed. Um, and so uh, the Electoral College creates some um, craziness around or some pressure in order to solve some of these things. Um, and one of the things that just kind of keep in mind as we go forward for this year is that that pressure can come out the more uncertainty there is around some of these electoral outcomes. So I'm gonna turn things over to Rob at this point. Thanks, Ed. Good morning, everybody. I see a, a whole lot of my former students, our former students. I've been at Wittenberg since 1987, so quite a number of years. And uh, this is a, a great thing to be able to get together virtually and talk about the election and uh, have you guys uh, throw in some questions and, and see where we go with, with some of the questions here. Uh, Ed has done a great job of, of talking about the reason why we have the Electoral College and some of the initial history and certainly the kind of constitutional question or co a constitutional crisis of 1800 that led to the 12th Amendment uh, and certainly how the, how the process works. Um, and I, I think uh, at least gave you a, a good sense of, of why Bush v. Gore, v. Gore was significant relative to that safe harbor date. Um, so let me just pick up on a couple of things um, that I would like to, to uh, add. The first one is, I wanna talk about two things really. Um, one is this issue that we hear sometimes of, of the faithless elector. Um, and this links back to Ed's um, um, discussion of, of sort of the compromise of why the Electoral College got there, uh, what the framers thought the electors would be doing, primarily standing above partisan politics, trying to uh, get, quote unquote, the best uh, statesmen for the jobs of, of president and vice president. Um, 
And the notion that, that they believed firmly at the time, I think it's, it's a pretty good argument to make that they thought the electors should be independent uh, and make their own decisions and even potentially bring somebody in as president or vice president who wasn't even um, listed as a candidate. I think that that's theoretically um, an, a, a decent argument uh, for how they thought the electoral college should operate. So I'll, I'll talk about faithless electors and um, a recent Supreme Court decision just this summer that deals with that uh, and whether or not states can, can bind their electors to the electoral outcome of the popular vote. And then I wanna shift gears and talk about some potential reforms that we might think about uh, going back to Ed's points about rules of the game and legitimacy of, of elections and outcomes and, and the willingness of of uh, citizens and parties and, and uh, actors in our system to continue in the game rather than um, not. And so I think it's significantly uh, um, important to talk about some of the reforms and kind of explain those um, as well. And also uh, we'll, we'll give you some, the results of what might've happened if those reforms had been in place in the 2000 election. I was able to do some analysis of that several years ago. Uh, so the outcomes, the outcome might have been different in some, with some reforms. It would have been the same with other reforms. So I think that'll, you'll find that kind of interesting. Uh, and so that's where I'm going to go. And then Ed and I have agreed to, to uh, tell you what our worst nightmare scenario might be for this election. Uh, so we'll see if, if that stimulates some discussion as well. So let me, let me uh, get back to this idea of, of faithless electors. Uh, again, uh, the idea was that the Electoral College would be um, independent statesmen. They would, they would rise above partisan faction. They, the framers didn't really think about parties necessarily, but um, Ed mentioned, of course, Madison came up with this idea and, and Hamilton was um, the most famous um, supporter of it in Federalist number 68, which, which Ed referenced. I just thought I would read a section of that, but because I, I think it's kind of telling in terms of, of their thinking. So bear with me. In, in Federalist 68, Hamilton says, the process of election affords a moral certainty that the office of president will never fall to the lot of any man who is not in the eminent degree endowed with the requisite qualifications. Talents for low intrigue and the little arts of popularity may alone suffice to ele may elevate a man to the first honors in a single state, but it will require other talents and a different kind of merit to establish him in the esteem and confidence of the whole union or of so considerable a portion of it as would be necessary to make him a successful candidate for the distinguished office of the president of the United States. So he among uh, others of the, certainly the Federalists uh, founders, and, and by the way, at the Constitutional Convention, I tell my students all the time, there were 55 delegates, uh, so there, were, there were over 80 delegates uh, appointed, several of them didn't show up, and most of them were anti-Federalists, like Patrick Henry, for example, he said he smelled a rat, he didn't even want to go, and I think that that's significant, that the majority of the founders were Federalists, they wanted a stronger national government, we might have gotten something quite different uh, as a new constitution, if more of the anti-federalist um, um, delegates had shown up to the convention. So this, this idea that they should be independent raises um, an issue that is referred to as the faithless elector problem or, or issue where um, it's expected these days that if, as Ed said, if um, your state goes for a particular candidate in, in, uh, in terms of plurality of the vote. And by the way, it's just a plurality, not a majority. So whoever gets the most votes in 48 of the 50 states, um, that candidate slate of electors then is, is uh, certified by the state legislature to go to the electoral college. Um, and the expectation is that they of course would vote for that candidate. But the tension uh, arises here because of this notion that the framers had of, of, of independence. And we've had over the course of 50, um, I guess 58 election cycles, uh, we've had 165 instances in which the electors did not vote for the candidate that won the, the popular vote in their state. 
Uh, interestingly enough, um, of the 165, uh, 63 of those were in 1872 when Horace Greeley was a candidate and he died um, and, and therefore uh, he, he died after the election day, but before the Electoral College had, had met. And so they cast their votes for somebody else. Um, and another chunk of, of sort of faithless electors, again, electors who don't uh, vote for the candidate who won the most popular votes in their, in their state, um, occurred in 1836. Uh, and that was in Virginia. Um, the entire 23 electoral delegation in Virginia uh, decided to abstain from voting uh, because they didn't like uh, the candidate Richard Johnson. Um, and then we've had a smattering of, of uh, faithless electors over time, uh, including even in uh, 2016, uh, we had uh, some faithless electors in Washington and California and a few other states. Um, and almost immediately at, after the founding, states began to, um, state legislatures began to try to bind their electors or get their electors at least to pledge to vote for the winner of the popular vote. And um, the, the pledging was, was the primary uh, effort to, to get them to commit to the popular vote outcome. Um, over time, some states adopted laws that would officially bind them to the popular vote um, and even penalize, uh, penalize faithless electors. The uh, most significant, uh, I guess, harshest penalty right now is in South Carolina. It's a felony if you do not vote um, as an elector for the popular vote winner in South Carolina. Ohio has a, a law that binds electors, but there's no penalty. Um, if an elector does not vote for the popular vote winner in Ohio, then that vote is, that elector is removed and there's another elector changed. Uh, another vote uh, is added to, to the popular vote uh, winner. But in, in Washington and Colorado, we had a couple of um, faithless electors, if you will, in, in 2016. And um, the states had election laws that bound their, their electors. And so Colorado um, penalized uh, their faithless elector with a, with a fine and replaced him. And um, in Washington, uh, the person was essentially replaced. There was no fine, but they were replaced. And um, both of those electors filed suit claiming that uh, the, the, the binding law was unconstitutional, that the federal um, electoral college ought to, electors ought to be independent. And they went back to Federalist 68. They went back to the, the arguments at the founding about the notion of these people being independent and above above the election actually. Um, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took both those cases essentially together. Um, the case is called Chiafalo versus Washington because it was the Washington case that was listed first. Uh, and they said it was okay. States could actually bind their electors. States don't have to, but it was not unconstitutional for states to actually have binding laws. So right now, 33 states do have binding laws and um, commit their, their electors to vote for the winner of the popular vote in, um, in their state. Um, that means some states don't, um, which raises the question of, could we still have faithless electors? And I, I think it's possible. We, we really don't see that happening. Um, some of you know that, that uh, I, I've been a um, regular columnist for Cox Media here in Ohio for a number of years. And um, I wrote kind of a tongue in cheek piece back in 2016 about this question. What I really try to do is educate voters on and readers on these kinds of things and then just uh, get them to try to reflect on what could happen. And so I wanted them to think about this idea of electoral, the electoral college and the faithless electors. And, and um, Texas, as it turns out, is the largest state that does not bind its electors. And they've got uh, one of the largest um, number of electors, of course, one of, the, one of the biggest states. And so I suggested that maybe um, if, if um, they wanted to, a number of them could decide that they didn't like the outcome. And uh, there were a number of people in Texas who were concerned about the Republican nominee, if you recall, particularly uh, one of the senators there who ran against him in the primaries. And so I just suggested at, to get people to think about this, maybe, maybe the Texas electors, uh, if, if uh, Donald Trump wins Texas, which it 
it's most likely that he would, maybe they would not like that. And maybe they would decide they're going to vote for Ted Cruz. They're, you know, they're, they're Senator there in Texas. And, uh, you know, that, that would, that would create a constitutional crisis, certainly, but it wouldn't be illegal in Texas for them to do that. It probably would have triggered a, a binding law in the state legislature, I suspect, but at the time it was possible for them to do that. Of course, they didn't do that and we didn't have that crisis, but um, nevertheless, that that's, um, has been resolved at least by the Supreme Court as not being unconstitutional to bind electors, even though not all states do that right now. So I'd like to shift then to some potential um, changes or reforms we might consider because Ed's notion of a legitimate outcome versus a constitutional outcome is very important here. Um, you know, are we, do we think that the system has been fair? Uh, are, we, are we okay with the outcome? Do we think the rules make it so that we have a good chance of, of winning if we work hard and try to get our supporters out there? Those are all important questions that, that we as voters ask. Um, and we've had five instances historically where the winner of the popular vote has not um, won the electoral college vote, which is the way it's supposed to work. That's the constitutional way that we elect presidents. But it certainly raises questions. I like to tell my students it's, it's, that, it's that two by four that slaps us on the side of the head every four years, right? So, oh yeah, how does that work? How, how could that happen, right? And we've had two of them recently, the 2000 election, of course, 2016, where, where that occurred. Um, it hadn't occurred uh, prior to 2000. It had not occurred since eight, 17, or 1888. Um, and then it was 1876. And then, of course, the 1800 election was, was the other crisis. Um, so in, in 2000, people were like, oh, my gosh, how could that happen? And, and there was a lot of flurry of, of legislative activity and effort to maybe make some changes and, and, and potentially um, make the outcome reflect more closely the, the popular will. Of the, of the nation. Um, and, and let me talk about the changes that have been put forward over the years, and then I'll tell you what might have happened with the 2000 election if, if those changes had been in, in place. The, the first one, obviously, that people talk about is why don't we just get rid of this electoral college? Uh, it irritates me, not me personally, but the argument is it irritates me that the, that the framers didn't trust us. I mean, we vote for everybody else directly. Why can't we vote for our president? This is ridiculous. Why do we have to go through this electoral college? So the, the argument there is let's just get rid of it. Let's just abolish it, abolish it and use a popular vote. That of course would require a constitutional amendment and that's hard to do. Another option is what two states already do because states are given the, the authority in Article Two to uh, so select their, their electors, decide how their electors are gonna be selected and then to uh, determine how they, you know, what instructions they give to the electors, including binding them if, if they want to. So two states have decided against using the winner-take-all system, Maine and Nebraska, and they use a district system. So there is one electoral college vote attached to each congressional district in those states, and then the two votes that sort of coincide with the U.S. senators, those are, um, uh, won by the person who wins the popular vote statewide, but to win the other ones, you have to win the popular vote in each of those congressional districts. So it is possible in those states, and it did happen in 2016, for the first time in Nebraska, actually, that uh, the Nebraska Electoral College actually split its vote uh, because um, uh, Hillary Clinton actually won one of the congressional districts in Nebraska. So two states actually do what we call the district plan. That's not that doesn't require a constitutional amendment because obviously they've already done it. They have decided that, that they'd prefer that. Another couple of, of uh, options relate to a proportional uh, system where uh, we could nationally, the, the uh, states could tell their electors, all right, whoever wins the, uh, whatever the proportional outcome of the popular vote is nationally, that's how we're going to split our electoral college vote in the state. Or they could do it at the, at the state level and say, all right, Ohio and uh, electoral college uh, or electors, um, whatever the popular vote outcome is in Ohio, that's how we're going to split our Ohio electoral college vote. So it could be a national proportional plan or it could be a state plan. Um, both of those would really not require a constitutional um, amendment because the states could require that their electors do it that way. 
so those are three options. Abolish the Electoral College, use the district plan that two states use, use a proportional plan of one or the other, uh, which would not require a constitutional amendment. Another option that's been around for quite a while is called the National Bonus Plan. And under this scenario, um, whoever wins the popular vote, the states would continue to decide how to um, um, allow, how to bind their electors or how to instruct their electors. Um, and I imagine most of them would keep the winner take all system like we have. But in addition to that, whoever wins the popular vote would be awarded an additional bonus of 102 electoral college votes. Um, where does that come from? Well, two for each state plus two for the District of Columbia. That's why 102 is the initial idea here. It could be, it could be a thousand, it could be a million, right? It doesn't matter. The idea is we make sure that whoever wins the popular vote becomes president. Um, that most likely would require a constitutional amendment if we went in that direction. And then finally, another uh, more recent proposal that is out there is uh, called the National State Compact Popular Votes Plan. And it is um, similar to the National Bonus Plan, but basically it goes like this. States that agree to enter into this compact or agreement um, would award all of their electoral college votes to the winner of the popular vote as soon as enough states enter the compact where the number of electoral college votes in those states equals at least 270, which is the, the magic number that we need right now to, to win the popular vote or to win the electoral college. Um, right now, there are 16 states in the compact. We have in, in those states, um, the number of electoral college votes is 196. So we're still a number of electoral college votes away from having that compact take effect. Um, and in, in every state, there has been legislation introduced in the state legislature to uh, have each, to have the state um, enter into that compact, including here in Ohio. And in the states that, um, Ohio has not passed it, obviously, it's not part of that compact. Uh, in some of the states, one house has passed it, but the other house has not. And so where we stand right now is 16 states equal to 196 electoral college votes for the national compact. Now the constitution, by the way, allows for states to enter into agreements or compacts in article four um, with the support of Congress. And you know, Congress has not really uh, put up any, any um, uh, opposition to this I idea of states being able to do this because fundamentally the constitution gives the states the right to determine how their electors uh, are, are uh, supposed to be voting. So those are the potential reforms. Let me real quickly end then with uh, what might have happened in, in uh, 2000 if these reforms had been in place. Um, if we would have had, uh, you may remember it was Pres uh, Vice President Gore against uh, former governor of, of Texas, George W. Bush, um, and Gore won the popular vote. So obviously with, if we didn't have the Electoral College, Gore would have won uh, the popular vote in that, that instance. Um, Bush received 271 electoral college votes and Gore got uh, 266. So the bonus plan obviously uh, would have also um, resulted in, in Gore winning uh, the presidency. He would have ended up with 368 votes. Bush's would have, would have been 271, as I said. In terms of the proportional plan, uh, the two variations, if we, if we um, look at the um, national totals, um, then under the national method, Bush would have received 358 electoral or 258 electoral college votes. Gore would have gotten 260. And then Ralph Nader, remember him? He ran and got a number of, of votes. He would have actually gotten 15 electoral college votes under the national proportional plan. So nobody would have gotten um, a majority of the electoral college votes. The 270 number would have not been reached. So then, as Ed said, it, it would have been thrown into the House. And um, you know, a couple of possible ways that you might think about how the House would vote. One would be this, they only get to cast one vote per state. So you know, how is the state going to figure out how to cast its vote? Well, one option is they just vote for whoever won the popular vote in their state. Another option more likely might be that uh, they vote for um, whichever candidate uh, the majority of the delegates in Congress from that state support. So 
I, I went with that, and under that scenario, um, uh, Bush would have won th that particular uh, outcome. Under the uh, state-based uh, system, um, the uh, same thing would have happened. There, nobody would have won the, the uh, uh, Electoral College. Nobody would have gotten to 270, so it would have been thrown into the House again, and I, I suggest that probably Bush would have won that outcome. Um, in the district plan that we have two states using right now, Maine and Nebraska, as we said, um, Bush would have won 297 votes and Gore would have won 241. So actually Bush's um, margin in the Electoral College would have actually increased under the district plan if that had been put in place. Uh, so that's kind of interesting to think about. Would we have had really had a different outcome under these scenarios? Some of them we wouldn't have had a different outcome. Others, yes, we would have. So um, thought you might find that interesting. The, the hard part about that analysis was getting the, the um, outcome, the uh, popular vote outcome broken down by congressional districts. Uh, that, that requires a little bit of digging, as Ed will, will attest to. And, and uh, I thought about doing that with 2016, but, but I'm a busy guy and I didn't do it. So, um, so I, I will stop at that point in terms of what I wanted to add to how the Electoral College works um, and some of the um, issues related to, um, to it. Um, and then I'll, I guess I'll turn it back to Ed. You, you want to talk about your worst nightmare scenario or at least raise, raise a concern of what you think might happen, then I'll chime in with one and then we just throw it open. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, well, my worst case scenario f um, is around this question of the safe harbor deadline. Um, and so we, we have seven states where the um, that are likely sort of the big swing states this year, where, where the outcome is, is really close and up for grabs. Um, and in four of those six states, we have divided government, uh, meaning that the Secretary of State, who is in charge of certifying the election, um, is appointed by the governor and is of the same party as the governor. And the legislature is of a different party. And so if there is significant um, concern about the uh, about how votes are being counted, right? So, so one of the scenarios that is, is potentially going to happen is that on election night, um, you may see um, that one candidate is, a, is ahead on election night, but as mail-in ballots and other things start to come in, it's possible for that to flip, right? That all of a sudden now someone else is ahead. And to the extent that that is seen as um, illegitimate, or there's questions about whether that would happen or not, um, you could come up with a scenario where there's going to be, you know, that's going to be legally contested, right? They're going to they're going to look into whether that um, whether that's the case. In those situations, um, uh, it would be possible, right, for the um, for the how for the legislature and the secretary of state in those different states to disagree. And it is possible for those two entities to certify and send to Congress two separate slates of electors. And that has happened before, right? So actually in uh, 17 or 1876, one of the big issues in 1876 was three states sent two slates of electors because they um, disagreed on what the right outcome was. And Congress had to then try to figure out, well, which of these two slates of electors are we supposed to accept? And they ended up doing this deal where Rutherford B. Hayes was, the Republican, was, was, given, um, was given the presidency and the Electoral College votes in exchange for ending Reconstruction, essentially. And so I'm nervous about the language that causes so much concern about um, the integrity of the election that that's gonna create electoral outcomes in these states where they will, they will struggle to meet the safe harbor deadline um, and that it's going to lead to the two, ent the two parties not agreeing on what the actual outcome is and sending two sets of ballots up. Doing that is then going to cause Congress to figure that out um, and there's some um, question about uh, how they will actually go about that. 
um, what, what would actually be uh, the process for figuring that out. And I just think that's a recipe for um, dramatic turmoil. <laughs> so that, that's, where, that's my nightmare right now. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, uh, as I was thinking about what would I say as my, my absolute worst nightmare, uh, that is one of the concerns that I've got too, Ed. And, and if, you look at, uh, if you look at the battleground states um, and the control of the state legislatures in the battleground states, they're, they're pretty much all Republican states. And if we had any sort of, of um, controversy over elections and counting elections, um, um, but let's say that, that Biden, say, ekes out at least what seems to be the, the outcome in those states, but there's still controversy. I mean, the, the state legislatures being controlled by the Republicans might actually submit another slate of electors. And so we have the, the uh, quote unquote outcome of Biden electors, but then the state legislature with, with controversy and, and uh, uncertainty deciding that there needs to be another slate of electors. And, and so uh, along with what you've suggested here, you know, what happens to that? Well, Congress is gonna have to sort that out. So that, that's kind of a scary scenario. Um, I guess my, my absolute worst nightmare uh, is violence. Um, if, if we have um, a really close election uh, and there, there are questions about ballots and, and um, yeah, real, um, potential uh, concerns about uh, the count, um, you know, would we, would we end up with some sort of violence taking place? And um, I, I think that that's a little far-fetched, but it's not with, without uh, concern. And um, so, if, if, you know, I, I, I would say that would be my absolute worst, may, worst nightmare, I suppose. There's a question in uh, the chat, I guess, from Terry McDaniel about uh, he says the EC electoral college sounds like a Byzantine system. Aren't faithless electors a potential source of tyranny? What would be the weakness of a system where the popular vote elects the president? Well, yeah, they certainly are potentially a source of tyranny. They're also potentially a source of, of um, uh, cooler heads from the framers' perspective. Um, I would say, in, in the second question, what would be the weakness of a system where the popular vote elects the president? Um, I would say, well, the framers would argue that the people might be duped. That's why it's there. Personally, I would say I don't see much of a weakness. We, we elect everybody else in this country. Um, seems like, personally, in my opinion, we could probably elect the president as well. Um, could, be, could it be a source of tyranny? Well, sure, it could be if, if a whole bunch of the electors started going their own way. Um, 33 states have binding laws, 33 states could potentially rein that in, uh, and I don't think it could get too crazy, but the potential is certainly there. That's a good question, Terry. There's one, there's one thing that I'd add sort of to the potential defense of the Electoral College that I think would be a, I mean, it's rooted in the framers, but the, it's the sense that, um, you, you know, that, that legitimate outcomes can be a function of majorities, but they were scared about a tyranny of the majority. And so there's this idea that you build majorities in specific ways and that a majority or the election of a president should maybe not only have the majority support of the, the, the people. I think most would generally agree with that, but it should also have um, support from a diversity of states. And so one of the ways that the Electoral College works is that it gives a little bit of a boost to less populous states and helps to um, ensure that the president gets support from both more urban and more rural kinds of states. Um, but right now it tilts in that sort of state balance kind of world and can create these outcomes where the popular vote winner doesn't win. And so it would kind of be ideal in my world if we could come up with the system where the, the popular vote winner always wins, but that there's a system that encourages this spread across states as well. It's, it's hard to know if um, we haven't really come up with a system that would allow that to happen. Can I interject for a minute? Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff I saw on the internet before, but uh, there, it's 300 and 30 or 33 square miles versus 300,000 square miles. That that was the difference that uh, 
And I'll tell you, we've got a family out in the country and you drive out there, it's a totally different world from the inner city. And if you let New York City and San Francisco rule the country, you're gonna have half the states leaving, I'll bet. Yeah, and that definitely speaks to that idea that trying mm -hmm. to, to balance that out. Um, yeah, there, I agree. I mean, that's, that's a, um, certainly points to the notion of, of protecting what we might call states' interests and rural versus urban interests. Um, but there's also the, the competing tension of each vote county. And, um, you know, just where people live in different places and um, each person has a vote. And, and right now, uh, I think there's a good case to be made that the Electoral College under, that under counts, if you will, or under uh, prioritizes some states' votes. Uh, Wyoming's uh, Electoral College votes essentially count 68 times greater than California's Electoral College votes due to the population. So as Ed says, it, it, it's, it's a protection of states' interests there due to the compromise at the, front, at the founding. Uh, it's also a recognition of, of um, rural versus urban, I think, uh, at least implicitly. So your, your point's well taken, Dave. Um, but uh, I, I think a, a strong argument can be made that each individual vote ought to count. And as people begin to think that their vote doesn't count, then the legitimacy of the system begins to be called into question. They drop out of the system. Um, and if alienation gets too great within uh, a country, we, we do know um, that revolution potentially can emerge and, and violence. And so um, all of those things are in tension um, as we think about the Electoral College sort of illustrating many of those, those ideas. Well, our neighbor here at uh, Michigan, uh, Detroit tries to control the entire state and, it, it, and the rest of the state won't put up with that. And that's very similar to what you're talking about. I mean, the votes in Detroit could control the entire state and that won't work as diverse as Michigan is. Yep, we, um, uh, there are a number of questions, so let me tick through some of them. Um, so Austin Adams asked, would Congress be deciding um, which elector slate before or after the new Congress? That's a good question. Um, so they won't, they won't settle that until the new Congress. And so they open them on January 6th, which is after the new Congress has been seated. And if they open up two competing slates of electors, then at that point they have to decide. So it'd be the new Congress. Um, have we experienced an incumbent presidential candidate casting dispersions on the electoral process prior to the election as we're currently witnessing? I'm trying to think of what that would have looked like. Um, Rob, does anyone come to mind for you? Well, nothing really comes to mind. I mean, part of Part of it is we're, we're comparing 2020 to maybe the 19th century when we didn't have the kind of media and social media. So it's hard to say, but um, I, I think this is different from a lot of what we've seen in the past where, where candidates have been upset about different things and maybe have, have um, you know, tried to complain about processes, but I, nothing really comes to mind that maybe compares to this. I, I think this is kind of new. Um, we certainly have a tradition in this country of peaceful transfer of power and everybody committing to that. Um, and, you know, Seth, certainly with Washington, he could have, he could have had another probably two or three terms if he wanted to, but he, he stepped down and said, we need to, to do this. Um, so I, I, Ed, I can't, I can't think of, of, of anything that would maybe compare to what we're seeing right now. Um, Gene in, in Florida um, as no party affiliation. I'd have no idea. This is a great question, Gene. I have no idea who our electors are. Should I know them? Do we elect them? Yeah, great question. Um, some states actually, and when you, when you vote in the presidential primary, uh, a few states actually, you don't see the president's candidates' names on the ballot. You actually you see the slate of electors. And so you're, you're actually voting for electors. That's just a few states. Most of us when we vote, we see just the candidates' names, but behind those candidates' names are slates of electors that are pledged to those candidates. Um, so you can find out who they are. Basically, in each state, the parties decide how they, how they get assigned. Many of them are honorific positions, so a lot of them are 
elected officials in the state uh, from each party are, are part of the electoral college slate if that party wins the, the popular vote. Um, but um, you, you, can, you, you can find that out by, by checking with your, your state party association if, uh, or state party um, members. Um, that would be the best way to figure that out. Um, there's a question, I think it was related to the earlier one, timing on ele uh, the timing on electoral selection by the states is also an issue that new, new elected congressional folks or current folks, and I think that might be referring to what legislate, state legislature would elect the electors or appoint the electors, and so they, that would actually, the new um, state legislature would not have been appointed yet following the election, and so the electors, um, the, the legislature that would have been in place on election day is the mm -hmm. one that is seating, that would play a role in determining what electors are appointed. Yeah. Um, and then it's the new Congress that would uh, receive those electoral votes. Is that what you meant, Brandon? I, I wanted to make sure I got that question correct. It's okay. Yeah, Robert, um, it sort of goes back to what we've talked about um, a little bit ago relative to, you know, what, what is the Electoral College, what, what, what kinds of, of interest is, is the Electoral College trying to balance? Um, and yes, the results, if we didn't have the Electoral College, we probably would have different results uh, because everybody's vote would count the same in that instance. And um, I think urban, urban areas would have probably more influence on the outcome. Um, so you're right, we, we do have a republic. The framers are trying to balance all of those things. That's why the Electoral College is there. So your point's well taken. Some of these are, um, I think, must have been entered at specific points, and it's hard to know exactly what, what they mean. So some are just comments, and we'll kind of let those comments stand. Oh, but, like to rest, ask yeah, Gene, Gene has about the national, it's not the national bonus plan. Well, the national bonus plan, but also the state compact plan. Um, yeah. If your state's not in that compact, um, well, the reason they're not in it is because they don't want to be part of it, clearly. Otherwise, they would just say, yes, we'll be part of it. Um, does that make the election in your state moot? Well, it doesn't make it moot. Uh, it's still It's still the Electoral College making decisions, but states do get to decide how to instruct their electors. And if they decided to be part of the compact, they're gonna instruct their electors to vote for the person who wins the national popular vote. Uh, if your state hasn't done that for whatever reason, then yeah, you might feel like that, that that's unfair, but um, you know, that's one of the, the sort of interesting things about how the constitution gives this power to the states to instruct their electors. Um, David wrote, um, has there been discussion about intervention by the Supreme Court and how that figure in? Of course, you know, anytime there's a legal battle and that goes um, uh, through the state system, there can be appeals to the Supreme Court that would deal with some precedents regarding um, e e you know, uh, equal votes uh, nationally. And so there is always the potential that the Supreme Court could uh, get involved much like they did in Bush v. Gore um, and have some impact there. Um, and uh, there's probably a certain degree of interest uh, on the Republicans to make sure that they have a full court seated. Um, and so there, that certainly must be factoring in, I would imagine, in some of their minds. Um, I think it'd be uh, kind of crazy for them not to be factoring that in um, to try to get someone um, seated on the court that might rule. The court will then face an interesting question because their their reputation would be on the line, and they're going to have to think about how um, overtly weighing into electoral politics might have some sort of impact on their own reputation. But um, that that is to be seen. Um, and I think you know I kind of want to expand a little bit on this next point um, that since the country is almost evenly divided, is it possible that whoever's elected will be considered illegitimate? 
Um, and I think that that's absolutely right and probably at the heart of what Dr. Baker's been talking about in terms of the fear of violence. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, depending on what circles you're in, um, you know, conservatives right now talk a lot about, about uh, one of what the founders would talk about as tyranny of the majority, right? And that's, I think, that idea of what um, what um, Doug talked about in Michigan, that the tyranny of the majority is essentially these, these urban areas that have all the population making decisions that make sense for urban areas, but then impose it on, on the, the minority of population that is living, not racial minority, but minority of voter population that is represented in rural areas. The same thing kind of happens broadly. And so there's a, a concern among, I think, conservatives that these remote um, tyranny of the majority kinds of situations can change what their world looks like. And it feels like something that echoes what the framers would be talking about. On the opposite side, you have liberals that are talking about sort of tyranny of the minority, right? And this idea that we have a minority government right now where we've had presidents who have not won the popular vote. Um, so the last two uh, president or uh, Republican presidents have been minority party presidents or minority presidents. You know, in the Senate, which blocks things, also represents a minority of the, of the population. And so um, we are set up right now for this, this challenge um, or this, this kind of clash where both sides kind of feel this almost existential threat. Right, that the Republicans feel like the majority is about to has if if they win would have the power to strip away things that they think are are fundamental and valuable, and the liberals who right now are are a more majority a majority coalition are saying, you know, we can't be the majority shouldn't be stopped from being able to do what it it wants to do, um, and so that frustration is is growing, um, and I think that's a big issue. Um, what would happen if one of the candidates dies before the election? Well, that's, you know, that's clearly a possibility. Um, we, we all know that President Trump has tested positive for COVID. Um, I, I am not convinced that, that Joe Biden won't eventually test positive either. My, my wife is a physician. We talk about this all the time. You know, an initial false negative test can't really be... Um, you know, trusted initially, especially uh, in such a, a short time frame there. So maybe he gets it too eventually. I don't know, but uh, they're both of the age that where the outcomes uh, could potentially be deadly. And um, we've already got people voting in some states. In Ohio, people start voting on on Tuesday of this coming week, and their names are on the ballot. So what would happen? Well, in in either case, whoever wins. Uh, if that person has deceased, then the state party affiliation, the state parties get to decide uh, who the replacement would be. Uh, there would be some, um, I think, coordination with the state legislature, but um, it, that begins to, to put us down a whole bunch of, uh, you know, rabbit hole scenarios, right? Um, but it's not, it's not totally, the, the probability of, of this happening is not, is not zero. Uh, it's, it is potentially something that could happen. Um, Ed, do you want to add to that? I mean, at, at this point, it's, it's the state parties that would have to decide who would replace those individuals who had deceased. Um, but that would, yeah. I'm sure, generate lots of legal concerns, right? People would probably file lawsuits about that. Right. No, it'd be a it'd be a huge problem. I mean, what I mean, what will happen is in the short run is um, the so the way that it's set up, the, the I guess it, part of it depends on whether or not the death occurs before or after the electoral college votes. Sure. And yeah. so if it's before the electoral college votes, there may be some way. So essentially, then um, let's say that um, in the states where Trump wins, if he were the one to be deceased, um, then the electoral the electors could just vote for Pence for president. Um, and there'd be nothing that would prevent them from doing that. And then they would have to come up with either they would, uh, you know, pick, um, well, then what would happen is they'd all sort of try to decide who's the vice president going to be or who are they going to vote for that way. 
those votes would go up. And so if uh, Pence could potentially be elected president in that case, and then um, if there was no agreement on who the vice president would be, um, or that, that wasn't settled, the Senate would figure that out. And so yeah. there'd be a, void, a vote between those two. If the Electoral College has already voted, now we're in like a, like I, I'm tempted to use an expletive here, and that might actually be like my, that may now be my new worst case scenario, <laughs> um, because there's, it's, it's not clear. So, well, what is clear is this, is that um, the votes cast for vice president um, and the votes cast for president, if you, if you had someone elected by the Electoral College to be the president um, and that person no longer was alive, then what I think would automatically happen is that whoever was vice president would then take over as president and then they would be allowed to select their own vice president. Um, right. But that's but it's, not it, happened. Yeah, <laughs> right. And I think you're right, Dad, but I think we would agree that it's not crystal clear what right. would happen. And yeah. I think there would, there, it, we would be, we'd be in a constitutional crisis. Yes, yes. Um, at a time when we're not good at solving problems ourselves right now. Um, uh, Nate, man, I like Nate Dreyfus. He, former student. Um, Hi, Nate. Nate. Nate's good at, at writing long posts. So that's a good one, Nate. Um, so you're right. I mean, what, so we talked about the majoritarian minoritarian situation and, and you're absolutely right. This idea that, um, you know, you can start to shrink the electorate um, and that, that can start to create real challenges. Um, I did not have Ed for class. Oh, you didn't. Oh, you didn't <laughs> someone write that? Yeah, somebody said, Ed, did you have Rob for class? <laughs> uh, no, I, wish I didn't. I Actually, I avoided him. I was scared of him. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, my, I had a different advisor. Um, yeah. Uh, so I had, I had, my professors were people that you may have heard of. So Dick Flickinger was one of mine, um, uh, Bill Bushimi. Um, uh, Jerry Hudson. So some of you uh, might remember some of those names. You probably took Linda Bennett for American stuff too, didn't you? I did. Yeah. She, she's the one that taught me that anytime you talk about the founding fathers, you do this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, where are we? Hi, Ward. I see, I've seen you there. It's good to see you. you've got a questioner about mail balloting. How could it affect? Well, it's, it's certainly going to, um, you know, delay the, the actual final count, right? Because states vary in, in terms of the number of days that they allow for counting of all of these things. Some of them, it's, it's three days. Some of it's up to even two weeks. Um, you know, if, if there are challenges and, and problems with figuring out some of those outcomes, uh, or they just get flooded and, and it's, it's, it's hard to get it done. Um, we, we begin to, to creep up to that safe harbor deadline that, that Dr. Haskey talked about. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's going to be challenging for us um, to, in, in certain states particularly to uh, see what the outcome is and see if they can figure that out uh, by the safe harbor deadline. But you shouldn't cancel your election night party as long as it's virtual award. <laughs> practicing good social distancing. Um, but unless it's a, I mean, unless it's a, a kind of a really blowout night, I, we should not expect to know election night. I, actually, on that issue of, of blowout versus close election, this relates to one of the questions that was asked about legitimacy. I think um, it, it's likely to be more likely than not to be maybe a close election. And, and that raised, that certainly raises the concern that, that uh, was asked about. Uh, one way that would sort of minimize the legitimacy crisis is if there is a blowout, right? Um, 
So if, if one of the two candidates just really has a, a really blows out in the popular vote and has a significant margin in the electoral college, that kind of tamps down the concerns a little bit about legitimacy. You go back to 1992 when Clinton ran and won against H.W. Uh, Bush and Ross Perot. Remember that guy? Um, you know, that sinking sound you hear is, you know, your, your federal money going to, to Mexico or whatever. Um, Clinton won the most votes and he, he became president, but he only won 42 percent of the popular vote. So, um, you know, there's there was there were some concerns about his his election because of of the um, kind of less certainly less than 51 percent of the popular vote, quite a quite a bit less there. So. Well, it's 11 o'clock and I, I actually have a commitment I've got to get to, so I need to go, Holly, if, if that's okay. This has been fun. I appreciate all the questions and seeing everybody. Welcome back Thanks. virtually to Wittenberg. We love this place. Thank Good you, to see Rob. former students. Yeah, thank you, Rob, and, and thank you, Ed. This has been a wonderful conversation. We really appreciate the time you took with us today. You're welcome. Happy to do it. Good to oh, see you all. Thank you. Yep. You guys Bye. gotta come back. Come see us. Greg, you're still there? <laughs> Hi, David. That was great, wasn't it? I just talked to John Ford. I got his phone number and email address now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. I'm going to watch it again. Yeah, thanks, Gene. Thanks, David. It was great working with you on this project. Same here. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Gene. Holly, you did a great job. I appreciate Wittenberg's support, and I think this was terrifically successful. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for all your support and coordinating. Please convey to the two professors that I thought they did an excellent and outstanding job. Absolutely made, will. Made with proud. Mm -hmm. All right, right all, I'm going to close up the meeting. I actually need to go to another uh, tailgate Zoom, and Gene, I will see you at 2 o'clock. Okay, good. Take care. Bye-bye right. now. Good job. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.